welcome to episode 22 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm your host, Josh Laborious, Vicar Josh Laborious, if you're interested or care about my title at all. And if you haven't noticed, this is the first podcast in several weeks. That's because I ran out of topics that people had suggested or questions that people had asked. So instead of kind of forcing the issue, I decided that we would do podcasts when topics were requested. A topic has been requested, so here we are. This week we are going to be discussing the violence of God. This is a topic courtesy of Marianne D. And uh, we're going to go forward and we're going to discuss it and kind of brought on by some of the issues that I think have been made more public in the in, I guess, the Christian news world lately. Um, with that being said, feel free to submit topics of your own. If, if there is a issue or a topic that you are curious about, that you would like to hear me discuss, give you my thoughts, and, and kind of try and lay out the, the scripture and the, the reality of the Christian faith when applied to that topic, just send me an email, comment on Facebook, on, on YouTube, on whatever platform you listen to this on. So, those are all my shameless plugs until the end of the episode when, I'm sorry, you will hear more. But we're going to dive into the topic. And I think kind of the, the issue that closely aligns with this, I, this discussion regarding the violence of God is kind of this comparison between the, the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. Now, the reality is that these two, these are the same God. God is the same in the Old Testament as he was in the New Testament. And throughout both, he is a God of mercy and grace, yes. But he is also consist consistently a God who cannot abide evil. So as we go through both the Old Testament and the New Testament, he is consistent throughout. But what we see is we see a God who revo reveals more and more of himself as we continue through the story of everything. And when he sends Jesus kind of this ultimate act of mercy, it's not a plan B. And what I want to put before you quickly is if you go to St. Paul Lutheran Church and Schools YouTube page, there is a playlist, a Bible study series called Foundations in Faith led by Pastor Andrew Kubowitz. And he, he talks about Jesus and, and how he's not a plan B. Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection wasn't a plan B for God. And he gets into that. So you can also, a uh, related question to the violence of God might be why do bad things happen in the world. For that, I would encourage you to look at episode 16 of this podcast where we talk about suffering in the world and real suffering and real gospel. So with kind of that background and with those other resources put in front of you, we're going to step into the episode, Real Violence, Real Gospel. And I wanted to start in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, I think, it, it is where we see more of the violence of God more expansively. And in the New Testament, the focus is really more about Jesus Christ and his life and ministry. But the Old Testament still tells us a lot about the character of God, and I, I want to be very upfront that God is violent in the Bible. I'm not sidestepping this issue. I'm not pretending that he's not. So in 1 Samuel 15, in the first three verses, we say, Samuel said to Saul, who was at the time king of Israel, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote destruction all to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So I want to start kind of with addressing how people, for lack of a better way to put it, try and sweep this under the rug in that Amalek, who is the nation who is being referenced here, 
earlier in Israel's history had opposed them. They had actively opposed God's chosen people. And as a quick side note, in case you didn't pick it up through the context, Amalek is another ancient nation. And you may say, well, why do you bring up this specific story? Because there are several stories in the Old Testament where God is violent, where he causes the earth to swallow people up. Where I mean, in Egypt, he strikes down every firstborn of the Egyptians. I'm bringing this up because I, I wanted a very clear example where God does instruct and command and perform violence. I don't want to sweep this problem under the rug, like I said, because, and I want to be clear, this isn't an isolated incident. If you go through the the story of the Old Testament, God commits violence on behalf of his people, and, and sometimes to his people, fairly regularly. So you may say, well, that that doesn't seem like a very good thing. Um, or you, you may say, well, that doesn't sound consistent with the God of the New Testament, but what we can take away from this, what I want to pull out of this, is that God is... Sorry, I want to reframe this whole argument, because the reality is God is righteous. If God does something, it is by definition good. God is good. God is holy. And you see, the reality is that every human being that has ever lived and will ever live is is steeped in sin and broken by sin. You see, the, the reality is justice would be God killing each and every one of us. So I think the real question is, why does God show mercy to so many people? You see, because when when God strikes down nations or individuals or people, that that is justice for our sins, for our crimes, for a rebellion against him. We are evil, and he has all right to punish us for that evil. But he doesn't. You see, because everywhere we see where God has not struck someone down, that is mercy. You see, we have no worth not given to us by him. We we have no rights before God. God. God punishes evil, and all of us are evil. So that's what I want to take away from this. What I what I want to be painfully clear on, what we do not take away from this, is some sort of command for violence. Because here we see Samuel tells Saul, the Lord has appointed you to wipe out these people. And some people in history have extrapolated this command or commands like it in the Old Testament to go out and, and commit violence. And they say it's on behalf of God, but the reality is this is an isolated, specific command. God is talking to a specific person at a specific time about a specific people. This cannot be generalized. This is history. You cannot take this and say, well, God has commanded me to make war on those who are not faithful. No, that's that's not what God's saying. He's telling Saul who is not here anymore, Saul is dead, to commit this violence against the Amalekites, who are also not around anymore because of the aforementioned violence. So what I want to be really clear is the the commands for violence in the Old Testament are not directed toward Christians today. If you take it that way, that is a misinterpretation of the text. So we're, we're not taking military instructions away from this. So what I want to be clear, and, and the other thing that I, I want us to, well, I guess, take away from this. So I guess I'm going back to what we can take away from this. Or No, I phrased this right. What we don't take away from this is that God is a teddy bear. You see, because I think a lot of us, in, in the American Christian church especially, we're comfortable. 
And we like to think God of, of God as a teddy bear. He sits in the corner, he's snuggly, he's nice, he has no sharp edges, and he is always forgiving and kind, and he has no capacity for violence, and that is not the God we see. And that God doesn't change in the New Testament. He is still, if you read Revelation, he says at the end of times, I am going to show you exactly how capable I am of this violence. So God is not a teddy bear. And and I think we do need to be reminded of that because it's, it's kind of uncomfortable to think that we have a God who would be within his rights to, to strike us down. You see, and kind of where I want to close this, this section on is that God alone can judge. And, and what I want to say there is we are not in a position to say that we should commit violence on behalf of God. We're not in a place to do that. God alone is in a position to judge uh, whether or not someone is deserving of death or whether or not someone is deserving of mercy. That is not our place. So the reality I want to take away from this passage of 1 Samuel, along with a lot of the other passages that follow it in the Old Testament, is that God has the right to destroy. He he is the creator, so he is within his rights to destroy his creation when it rebels against him. It is right and it is good for him to do these things. And But the reality is, I think the question is better framed as, why doesn't God just sweep us all away? And that brings us into the gospel, that God is merciful. He, he leverages his power and his authority for us. And for that, I want to I want to hop into Romans. And in Romans 6, starting at verse 20, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So this this textually speaking, this is part of the letter to the Romans, and it pretty explicitly lays out that the natural consequence of our existence, of our sin and our sinful nature, is death. We have this free gift of salvation, but the end of our sin is death. So when God is violent, again, he is in the right. Humanity is not inherently good, which I think is is kind of one of the, the core misconceptions of this. Humanity is not inherently good. We don't deserve anything of our own merit. So when God strikes people down, he's right to do so. Which brings up this response, and I think... In, in some people, I don't, I, I guess a lot of people, I, I don't know. But a response that goes something along the lines of, I can't believe in a God who would do something like that, who would commit violence, who would kill people, who would demand that his will be followed and the, the alternative is death. And my question response is, did, did you believe in God just because you thought he was, he was nice to you? Like, we don't just believe, we believe in God because it's true. We believe in God because he is the creator and redeemer of the universe. Because his Holy Spirit worked faith in us. We don't believe in God because he agrees with us. God is greater than us, so if we're in disagreement with God, we're the ones who are wrong. And the reality is, if he never punishes anyone, there is no consequence for rebelling against his will. So, there's this reality, there's this struggle, I think, in modern Christianity. There is faith in God versus faith in a, in a generalized deity that supports your life and your choices. And for those of you who maybe this is your first episode, 
there's a, I, I avoid theological language. I avoid theological language. I avoid philosophical language because I want to make this as accessible as possible. I, I don't want to make it any more obscure than I have to. So when I occasionally do use theological terminology, because I want to keep this grounded, I, I do my best to explain it. And I, I say that now because I have a theological term that I want to use here. And that, that term is moral therapeutic deism. Moral therapeutic deism. And what this is, it's, it's pretty simple when you break it down into the three terms of its title. Moral, it is a, a, a semi-religious system that has a moral code that inspires people to do good things. It is therapeutic because it makes you feel good. And it's called deism because that's kind of... Uh, D, the, that's a prefix that has to do with the things of God. It is a generalized faith. It's not too specific. Now, this, this is the overwhelming popularity. This is actually, I think, the overwhelming religion throughout the history of America. I think people, a lot of times they say, well, America is a Christian nation. Not really. America, throughout its history, has been much more in line with the idea of moral therapeutic deism than it has been with Christianity. Especially now. We People want to believe in a God that is useful to them, that makes them feel better, and that isn't too specific. Because they, they don't want to get bogged down with those details for one reason or another. So there's this reality that when we say things like, when there's suffering in the world, when terrible things happen in the world, God is in control of those too. That makes people who are in line with this philosophy of moral therapeutic deism, or MTD, very uncomfortable. When you say God is right to commit violence against people who go against his will, that makes them uncomfortable because that doesn't make you feel very good. So I think that's the struggle we have because our faith is in a God who is greater than our life, our choices, and our opinion. So when we think, oh, I can't believe in a God who, who disagrees with me and who would commit such violence because I don't think that sounds very nice, we don't believe in very much of a God because apparently he's confined by what, by what we think. And to be frank, I'm not impressed with a God who is confined by what I can understand and what I think is right, because I am full on in, in awareness of my lack of understanding and in my lack of, of holiness, of righteousness, of justice. So I really wouldn't want a God who was confined to that. So what, what I'm getting at here is the reality is we are called to be a faithful to a God, a specific God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who came to this earth as Jesus Christ, who died, who rose again, and, and a God who actively works in his creation. We're called to be faithful to that specific God who does punish sin and is totally in the right to do so because the wages of sin is death. So when we see God committing violence, when, when we see him ordering the, the death of the men and the women and, and the children of these various nations in the Old Testament, he is right to do so. And that is an uncomfortable reality for us to sit with. But the gospel that comes out of this Romans is that salvation is a gift and it is a freely given gift to us. Yes, God is violent and yes, God will punish those who are outside of his will. But salvation from that punishment, redemption in the eyes of God, is a free gift that he gives to us, to all who believe. And with that, I want to step into our a, a gospel reading. that we're, It's going to be our last reading we discussed today. And that's John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried, works have been carried out in God. And I, I want to really encourage you, if, if you zoned out for that reading, I want you to pause, I want you to rewind, listen to the whole thing, not just the poster quote, not just the beginning of verse 16. Because there's this reality here that has been consistent through this podcast, whoever does not believe, whoever is not faithful to God, is condemned. You see, when people say, oh, the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are different, no, they're not. Right here in the New Testament, in the Gospel, God is saying, I consistently punish evil. But the reality is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see a God who is also gracious and merciful. Yes, in the Old Testament, there was an entire sacrificial system so people could be free of their sins. But it was imperfect, and it didn't get the job done because people were too broken. And even as we even as people offered sacrifices, they fell short. So Christ came as the ultimate sacrifice, as the ultimate source of grace and mercy. And what John gets at here is some people like darkness. They don't want a God who, who actually tells them what to do. They don't want a God who would discipline the people of this world, who would actually punish evil. They want a God who makes them feel better, who maybe tells them good things to do, but they don't want a God who condemns them when they are wrong or condemns people when they're wrong. But the reality is if you are outside of Christ, there's nothing but condemnation. And the gospel is that we're safe from God's anger in Jesus Christ. So as we come to the close of this podcast, what I, I hope a couple points have come across. And if they haven't, I, I do hope you attribute them to my lack of foresight or my, my own shortcomings and not um, don't project them anywhere else. So the first thing that I hope I communicated here was that God is consistent in the, it's not a different God in the Old Testament or the New Testament. He consistently punishes evil. The second thing I hope I communicated is that he is right and holy to do so. When God punishes with death people who are evil, that is, that is the right and just thing, reward for their deeds, for our deeds. But the final thing, and this is the thing I hope that we can rest in, is that God, through the Old and New Testament, is a God of grace, who through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has made it so that we don't have to suffer the punishment for our sins and for our evil. And that's, that's incredible, that we can rest in that grace. And I hope that's where you rest, today, tomorrow, and for the rest of time. Brothers and sisters, this has been Real Violence, Real Gospel, hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. Please subscribe to this podcast and to St. Paul Lutheran Church on whatever platform you're listening on, whether that's iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, Podbean, or on YouTube. And with that, rather than wasting more of your time with shameless plugs, brothers and sisters, I'm going to wish you to go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.